Hello and welcome to our newest Cut Your Design talk, this time about architecture in the digital age. And with me, I have two great guests. The first one is Hector Kamps. He's a, the CEO and founder of PhiCubed, a huge contributor in dim, BIM modeling, sorry, digital architecture, and one of our great Katir champions. Welcome, Hector. Thank you, Narada. My second guest today is Shady Her. Um, he's a Cartier design expert and architect with a major in parametric designing. Welcome, Shady. Good to have Hi, you. Hi, guys. How's it going? All good? Very good. Thanks. So these days, we see more and more complex shapes in the field of architecture, thanks to parametric designing and the use of algorithms. Mm -hmm. Together with Hector and Shady, we will look at the evolution of parametric architecture first and see what impact the usage of digital tools have. And after that, um, Hector is going to show us some examples from his professional work to highlight how he is creating parametric shapes with the 3D Experience platform. So, Shady, I think you have prepared a nice overview for us. So I did indeed, Let's yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I may share my screen. Yes, great, thank you. So, uh, like Honorata mentioned, my name is Shady Kher, and today I would love to talk with you about parametric architecture, how it all started, and some current projects uh, from prominent architects. Uh, the term parametricism uh, was coined in 2008 uh, by Patrick Schumacher, who was partner of uh, Zaha Hadid uh, architects at the time. Way before parametricism became the strong movement that it is right now, Antonio Gaudi, the genius architect behind Zagrada Familia and Casa Pateo, used to practice the early parametric methodologies uh, by drawing inspiration from nature and conventional methods to create organic curvatures. In his early stages of designing, he built a model of uh, strings uh, weighted down with birdshot to create complex vaulted ceilings and arches. By adjusting the position of the weights or the length of the strength, uh, the strings, he could alter the shape of each arch and also see how this change influenced the arches connected to it. He then placed a mirror on the bottom of the model to see how it should look upside down. Frei Otto was a German architect and structural engineer noted for his uh, use of lightweight structures, in particular tensile and membrane structures. He also relied heavily on the same methodology Anthony Gaudi used. In fact, his design structures uh, were economical, ecological, and subject to a strict rules of physics. He implemented his famous lightweight structures for the roof of Olympic Stadium in Munich for the 1972 Summer Olympics, which is still standing today. And also for the Institute of Lightweight Structures at the Technical University of Stuttgart, which was led by him as a professor. I had the pleasure to study there myself. Moving forward uh, to the current methodology of parametric architecture, where computer processing uh, is heavily involved in the design process using digital tools like CATIA to create what's called BIM, which stands for Building Information Modeling, to reach higher efficiency and a perfect equilibrium between cost and resource efficiency, shorter project life cycles, safety, improved communication, structural uh, stability, and of course, design aesthetics. Some of the leading names in the architectural industry, to name a few, are Zaha Hadid, Frank Gehry, Ben van Berkel of Yon Studio, Herzog and Dimeron, Hani Rashid and Lise Anne Couture of Asymptote, uh, Wolf Prix of Coop Himmelblau, and Santiago Calatrava. I'll show you some examples of those four architects in this presentation. Let's start with Frank Gehry as he is the earliest adapter of BIM tools in today's architecture. On the left, you will see a Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. It is one of the most act, uh, acoustically sophisticated concert halls in the world, showing the direction of the curvature in the edge pattern of the metal facade sheets. 
On the other side, you see the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Using Frank Gehry's hand-built models, measurements were transcripted into several packages and data solutions of CATIA. Essentially, what it does is calculate point by point the tensions to which materials are subjected, generating a 3D model showing the different tensions and helping to calculate values for many of the museum's structural elements. The building was constructed on time and budget, which is rare for buildings of this type and size. Coming next to Zaha Hadid Architects. Starting with the mobile art uh, pavilion for Chanel, uh, which has been inspired uh, by one of Chanel's signature creations, the quilted bag. In Zaha's quest for complex uh, dynamic and fluid spaces, her work has developed an integration of natural and human-made systems via the new uh, digital modeling tools that augment the design process with techniques of continuous fluidity. The total fluidity of the Chanel Pavilion's curvilinear geometries is based on exploration and research into systems of continuous transformations and smooth transition. Zaha Hadid pushes the boundaries of architecture and urban design by creating visionary aesthetic and innovative buildings like this one. A 85,000 square meter Seoul Dung Demon Design Plaza with a museum, library, and school facilities. With the help of digital tools, Zaha Hadid architects try out a whole range of solutions from the very first idea throughout the creation process. Uh, they used numerous, often overlapping uh, data sources, and these must be merged, standardized, formalized, and meaningfully integrated into an overall structure. In projects of this size and complexity, accuracy is an, as important as flexibility as well as speed. Therefore, uh, 3D data is an important factor in the execution of such projects. Moving on to Yuan Studio. Uh, the Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart by Jan Studio is one of my favorite buildings, to be honest. Uh, the structure of the building is based on a trefoil. This mathematical cloverleaf form consists of three overlapping circles, with its centers uh, removed to form a void. Modeling the trefoil in 3D resulted the formation of a double helix. It, uh, its interweaving strands allowed for crossovers along the visitor routes. After, after creating the 3D uh, trefoil and the double helix model, uh, Yuan Studio was challenged with the structuring a hundred foot high space uh, while maintaining the integrity of the concept. The introduction of the twist resolved that. As an organizational element, the twist and, uh, enabled fluid transitions between spaces. Giving the museum's complexity an innovative character and tight uh, time frame for the design, planning, and construction, Yuan Studio had to work effectively. Therefore, they organized the entire input into one master model. This meant any changes could be implemented quickly and efficiently and they could immediately see how uh, they affected the rest of the building. Next uh, is the Allianz Arena Stadium in Munich by Herzog and Demohon. Digital tools uh, enable Herzog and Demohon to creatively develop 3D models while retaining the original design idea. This brings the highest level of design automation into the process, raising productivity to a level that is difficult to achieve with any other method. With that in mind, Herzog and Demeron can design innovative, highly developed, elegant structures, knowing that their designs can actually be built. The skin of the luminous body consists of large, shimmering, white, diamond-shaped ETFE cushions, of which uh, can be eliminated separately in white, red, or blue. The color of the cushions can be controlled digitally so that the home team playing the stadium can be identified from outside. Red for FC Bayern and blue for TSV uh, 1860. The changing appearance of the stadium will enhance its attraction as an urban monument, 
even for people who aren't interested in football. The next monument project, uh, monumental project uh, done by Hertha and Dimon is the Beijing uh, National Stadium. The Chinese National Stadium was uh, the 2008 Olympic Games most striking structure, uh, recognized all over the world. The circular shape of the stadium represents heaven. The structural form of the stadium is described as a bird's nest, hence the name. With its pattern inspired by Chinese style grazed pottery, the pattern was created by complex rules for which advanced geometry was defined. To ensure an, an impact and optimum design, Herzog and Demon established the design for the seating bowl first with the outer facade wrapping around it. With the help of uh, BIM analysis, various studies have been done on the structure to test the stadium under various earthquake conditions and ensure that the structure can withstand major shocks. I'd like to give the word further to you guys. Thank you for listening. Thanks for the overview, Shady. That was really nice. Thank you. And I would like to invite Hector to show us a little bit of his professional work that he's doing uh, to, you know, to highlight what changed and what is possible now in parametric architecture. Thank you, Anurata. And Shady, those are some of my favorite architects in the world and some of my favorite projects that you mentioned in your presentation. So I think that there's a lot that needs to be taken in when we talk about parametric design. Um, not only is it possible to generate complex forms, uh, it's, it's possible to generate them accurately and drive them into manufacturing and fabrication and assembly. So, you know, I always like to start with why. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing parametric design? Why, why are we doing CATIA? Why, why, won't, why, don't, why don't we do this some other way? It's very important to understand the, the why. Uh, and the reason we use CATIA for the things that we're doing is because it gives us a laboratory where we can take the design all the way, not only from a design concept, all the way to manufacturing, fabrication, and assembly and installation into the field. So CATIA really helps you drive it home and make the building real. It really helps you develop it fully in an automated way that's, that's cost effective, that's accurate, that's high fidelity, that you can trust the model, you can manufacture from the model, you can build from this model, and it can drive your construction into your project. And I think a lot of people fall short of these different steps and expect the same outcome, but it's really not so. So again, we and another reason, of course, we use the scripting and the parametric design is for the speed and the economies of scale that we get from it. Um, you know, I used to say jokingly before, uh, the until the world entered parametric design parametric modeling you really couldn't build the building in 3d and the reason why was because of change and change is a dirty word in architecture and construction nobody likes change and the reason nobody likes it is because it's not parametric so whenever you have to make changes in architecture guess what you have to change everything so if somebody wants to change a floor um, you know, make it 10 feet higher or make the building a little wider or whatever the change is, you have to historically manually go back and change absolutely everything. Parametric design changed that for us. Parametric design made it possible to not only embrace change, but to profit from change where um, no longer change was a burden, no longer change was a penalty. It was now uh, an opportunity to advance the design and to take the exploration further and more economical than we've ever been able to do before. So I'd like to share a couple of projects uh, that we've been exploring, uh, especially in the last couple of years uh, with this whole COVID pandemic. We, you know, we do a lot of research in architecture and design engineering. And so I'd like to share some of the research that we've been doing uh, with parametric design. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, hopefully everything works perfectly and there's no issues. So I'm going to start with, um, let's see. I'll try this and hopefully it works. 
Oh, give me a second here. Ah, sorry. Don't let me just um. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Uh, can you can I, can yes, I give her? Can. Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. Works Thank fine. you so much. All right. So the first project I want to show is uh for, this is from the Albahar Tower. So I'm just going to zoom in there, and I want to show you the complexity that's in this model. And you can see the level um, the level of detail that uh, we were able to achieve by modeling this in Katia. And everything here is parametric, including the kinematics of the panel. So this is a, um, every component of the panel is modeled. Every detail, every, nut, every bolt is completely taken into account and part of the automation. So here, for example, you can see I can run, um, I can run the panel up and down and you can see how parametrically the panel changes. So I'd like to run a video to show you how we use scripting and programming to generate this model. Okay. So here we're going to run a script and you can see how the model starts to become assembled and all the parts and pieces start um, becoming connected and start being generated from the script. Every piece is accounted for, and of course, the kinematics is also accounted for. You're going to see how we're able to move um, the shaft in the middle, which drives the change in the panel. This is all from research on this project. So once we get this, the, the core parametrics and kinematics working on this model, we then went one step further and started uh, building the assembly that would start to populate uh, the surface of the model. So here you can see how we then take the design and we start um, replicating it. Perfect. Thank you so much for seeing that. The second project I want to um, bring to your attention. Uh, this project was um, this project was really <laughs> sorry, a little. <laughs> I apologize. This project was um, a bridge done by Santiago Calatrava. It's in Bilbao, Spain, and for me, it was very um, kind of uh, dear to me because. Back in 2000, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Bilbao, Spain. And I remember coming across this bridge and being sort of mesmerized by it. It was such a beautiful structure. And I always wanted to be able to develop a structure like this. Um, so many years later, almost, almost 20 years later, I had the opportunity during the whole COVID crisis to uh, work with another gentleman by the name of Man Su Kim who happened to be in um, in South Korea. And we decided to decided to work together. And me working from Miami, I built all the inputs for the project and Mansu uh, developed the script and we automated this bridge. Um, to give you an idea, the most of the structure was developed. Um, if you eliminate the prepping time that we did for it, once we had the script ready, I think we had the model completely built within a week. And uh, I mentioned this to the uh, Dean of the School of Engineering here at Miami, and he struggled with this information. So what I did was we made a video of running the script so he can see how, um, how this was generated and that through scripting, you can build a bridge, which is by way from a world famous structural engineer. Uh, we were able to automate this and manage the complexity of the form. Again, if you look at the bridge, let me just show you here. If you look at it from the top, you see it has a little bit of a curve to it. 
it's not exactly uh, it's not it's not flat it has a curvature to it as a uh, central structural element that goes across in a straight line and then you have this barrel arch that goes across and that gives you the structure so if you look at the individual structural members they're not exactly the same each one you see here from the bottom each one is uniquely different and this is the kind of stuff that we love from parametric design because it gives you the design freedom where elements are allowed to be repeated but they're also allowed to be changed as they're repeated so here you see how these um uh, these bracing go across and each one is different as it goes across uh, the entire bridge so um all these elements are are all possible to be generated economically through parametric design. So let me go ahead and show a video uh, that we recorded of this process. So this video is by um, uh, Mansu Kim. He currently works from Paria now. We presented this at Co. Uh, I'm just gonna move it along just a little bit. Uh, I'm not gonna make you watch the whole thing, but I just wanna take you through a couple couple processes here so here you can see um, as we start to run the script the the bridge has a glass floor which by the way if you were to go there now they've kind of covered it because people tend to slip on it but the bridge actually has a glass floor going across so we use scripting to generate the glass floor all the structural members are hinged off the same guidelines so the same guys that created the glass floor are the guides for it, the inputs, um, are also the inputs for the structural members to support it. And you can see again, the level of detail and how those things are driven uh, by those guidelines. And all the detail supports for are also built into the model and also run from the same script. So here you can see the edge has like a gate, um, a gate that runs on the outside of it. You can see we ran a script for that. Uh, the handrails also have, um, are also developed by the script as well. So you can imagine the time it takes to basically build a model if you had to model these one by one. And here's an example of change. So for example, if we wanted to make a change to the structure, well, all we have to do is change one element and that element um, replicates itself throughout the throughout the structure and updates itself. So that's an example of when we talk about changes a dirty word in architecture. It is, but when you don't, when you have parametric design, you have a off way, you have a way to mitigate those changes and reduce the risk of change. So a little bit over, um, we talk about the inputs. So as I mentioned. I provided the, the, the reference geometry that was used in the project, which later was um, used to create the, uh, the inputs uh, and the EKL script that was created. We uh, produced template creation designs. And then um, of course we ran the script and generated the model. So I'll go ahead and, and, and pause that here. Let me go back here. So, Arata, do you have, I know you have some key questions you wanted to ask me. Yeah, so <clears throat> basically I really liked um, the model that you just shared on the 3D experience platform and we are receiving lots of comments here. Um, if this is all happening in the platform in real and um, yeah, maybe you can say something to that. Um, because uh, I think what our audience doesn't know is that you can not only use Katia on the 3D experience platform, but all the other brands as well, like Simulia and 3D Excite and so on, and combine them and do whatever you want to your product, your assembly design and so that's on. That's right. Yeah, that's 100% accurate. Uh, there's a lot that people unfortunately don't know about the integrated platform of Katia. One of the things that you're seeing is that 
you can run these things live. So for example, when I was working with Mansu Kim, we were co-authoring the model, working multinationally on the same model, um, using the same references and the same inputs and driving that all the way through the project. So yes, 100%, this model was a live model and it was live at all times. And it was a central control for the entire project. So everything was coming off of the model. All the inputs were coming off the model and they're not the each input is critical because each input has an element that that drives the model so then you know if you have a point and that point changes it changes the model so everything was um created from a a design driver they controlled the entire project i built the design driver myself and it wasn't very complicated it had a few key forms of the geometry that drove the shape of the bridge um the main structure at the bottom once we had those main key drivers everything else was built off of basically three main inputs uh, i think mansu kim added a surface for the bridge floor as one of the main inputs but once we had the surface floor everything was basically built from the from basically three main inputs that's great um, I think we need to um, add Shady again to our stream because we are receiving some specific um, questions for Katya, which I would like to blend in. Sure. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm just going to, to add uh, some questions and then we maybe can also talk about your views where uh, the parametric uh, architecture is heading to in the future and what you think how it's going to be used. Um, just very briefly, we have this one question that maybe you can answer best. So which software of the family of Dassault system is suitable for designing aircraft airframes and simulation of aircraft? Oh. Uh, good question, by the way. Um, I'd suggest that you, since uh, the future of the Dassault systems is heading towards the 3D experience platform, uh, you have the opportunity as a user to go to the 3D experience platform have a role assigned to you, which will be dedicated to specifically designing aircrafts. And you got all the apps and all the tools that you need uh, in order to, uh, to to develop that function in that sense. Yeah, thanks. We have a nice comment for you, Hector. Um, I'm going to blend this in as well. Um, so uh, it's about the... Uh, advanced usage of Katya. So we, we had lots of comments about how to get uh, the 3D experience platform and so on. I don't want to uh, g go into deep uh, with that right now, but maybe we can just, um, just say a few words about what you think, where we are heading with digital tools and architecture. What do you imagine is going to happen in the coming years? Yeah, I think Hector is muted. Oh. <laughs> yes, I think that one of the things that we're seeing is design. I keep I mentioned this a lot of my post. We're seeing a lot of design freedom where, you know, when I look at parametric design and what it could do for architecture, it's very liberating. And I also think it expands the role of the architect. And I think that's a really great opportunity for the architect to get more involved with Katia because it gets the architect reconnected with the world of construction, manufacturing and installation. So um, I think it's really important for our architect to get connected back to the building and these parametric tools help do that and help the architect remain in the driver's seat and in control of the project going forward. So um, when I look at parametric design, I think, um, I think it's really important from the perspective that it's very liberating because without parametric design, you can't reach these higher forms of expression in architectural design. It, it's just, it's not feasible. You may have really great ideas, but you can't manifest them. So I think when you have the two powerful tools, and again, we're, we're, in this case, we're using EKL as the engineering, uh, in, engineering knowledge template. But of course, you also now have Xgenerative, which makes object-based programming available. So we're seeing more scripting, more programming coming down the pipeline, which is going to be very liberating for the, for the industry. Yeah, Shady. I agree. Yeah, 
Uh, I agree with what Hector just said, and I would like to add up also the fact that back then architects uh, had uh, the issue that there's a, a certain perfection in the digital world that cannot be implemented in the manufacturing world or the reality in that sense. And it seems like that gap back then was very huge and very uh, like it's big, and now it's getting smaller and smaller. And the software is also supporting us also to even implement all of those manufacturing processes within this digital world and take it over to the manufacturing. So it seems like the architect have a huge control of the whole process from A to Z. And uh, it seems like the idea could be easily implemented. I'm okay. very curious if this is going to change not only architecture as such, so if we will see different kind of buildings and so on, but also the the way it is built, it's actually built. I mean. Absolutely, on our other with, um, so if you look at what's happening right now in architecture and the cutting edge, you're seeing the introduction of 3D printing and every day is making its way more into the physical world and less in the laboratory. And we're starting to see examples of buildings going up either in part, in pieces, or in total, where the building is starting to become 3D printed. And you're starting to see forms that were essentially impossible to develop before, that new advances in technology, again, are starting to give us a form of freedom and liberation, where these new designs are now becoming possible to be built. Um, so I think new forms of architectural expression are becoming available that otherwise would just be impossible to do, even 10 years ago. So I think we're going to see a very interesting world in the next 20, 30 years. Buildings are not going to be recognizable. They're going to be a lot sexier, a lot curvier. Uh, and their methods of construction, I think, are going to be wildly different than what we're doing now. And I'm really curious if we will get even more organic structures, like buildings are very, you know. And that's a bit boring. So maybe um, it's going to be much more interesting what we will see in the future. Yes, I think it's going to become more economical to develop more complex buildings. Uh, lots of people who've used KT in the, in the past, I've said that one of the reasons they've used it was to make those buildings economically feasible. Mm -hmm. um, by taking out the cost of the unknown risk factors in developing these complex designs, I think the new tools are going to allow these buildings more complex designs to make it to reality. Uh, a lot more economical than we've seen before. So we're going to see more freedom of design enter the industry uh, in buildings that are not the world's top 10 most expensive buildings in the world. You know, we're talking about buildings maybe for $10 million, not $5 billion. So yeah, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of a very bad example in Berlin, you know, the new airport. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> laughing at that one, right? I don't know what they have used. <laughs> for the project management probably not katia <laughs> no <laughs> okay um as we are getting mostly questions on how to get katia and how to learn katia i would like to all all of you to invite you to the katia creative design and styling community um, maybe we can show briefly the link here uh, which is here. So just go join the community and you will see lots of tutorials and how to's and tips and tricks. You can talk to experts like Shady or Hector, who are also part of the community. And uh, the community helps each other. And um, even if you have even more questions after this talk, you can join the community, you can uh, watch the talk again and, and start a conversation at any time. So um, for that, let me check. We have received some more. Um, what do we have here? So Katya has the potential to model every nut and bolt in an entire building and have the assembly inside of one model. Moving forward, digital twins is becoming more common and 2D is getting pushed aside at the way. Yeah, for sure. And the, yeah. the digital twin in whatever is produced in the future will get more and more important because it saves lots of uh, you know time, costs, and energy 
for sure. Yeah. You know, some of the work that we're doing now is uh, we're actually working with the so on a project at Miami International Airport, where we're in the process of developing a digital twin of the of the airport and the new central terminal, and we're connecting the airport to the virtual asset. So using um, uh, IoT, we are yeah. the Internet of Things. We're now connecting the physical building to the virtual digital twin so the two can talk to each other and we're able to monitor and do all kinds of really advanced things that i'm very excited about maybe maybe we can talk another time we can talk more about that when we further downstream on that process but we the airport is looking forward to doing this and i can't wait to connect everything to the digital model it's a yeah. long-term achievement of mine yeah. in fact uh, hector if i may mention uh this kind of examples is already implemented with the Allianz Arena. Uh, the lights, the LED lights that I've mentioned, are connected with the digital twin, and that's how actually they operate all the colors. That's fantastic. Yeah. I have another question here from the chat. Understanding technologies of 3D experience will be taking time, what people said. How can more people understand and use it? Shady, that's one for you, I think. Well, it's um, uh, as as a user of uh, Katia. Yeah, once you have an, the introduction to the software, usually you have some sort of an education portal to 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 use it. Um, it is sufficient enough to to have a push or start uh, with the software, but nevertheless, I still suggest that you talk with us directly through our communities and ask us all the questions or the, share with us all the difficulties you have. And we always we are always available in that sense. Yes, for sure. We have another comment in the community. The problem in any PLM software is the bug, and sometimes it took a lot of time to charge the page. Is this something you can uh, help on, Shady? I don't think so. If it was a bug in loading the page, maybe that's an issue of the internet browser itself. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> but at least, um, yeah, okay. Um, let me check. I think we have not too many more questions. As we are over time already, I would like to um, close the talk now. I would like to invite you to join us in the community because we can... Uh, so restart the conversation you can ask questions if you need help on katya whatever it is we have lots of champions like hector who are helping out um, our users um, and also the experts like shady um, who are always ready to help and um, finally i would like to um, give my thanks to my speakers and a special thanks to Shady, who is doing this project, this talk to me for the last time because he's leaving. Uh, and it was great working with you. I enjoyed it very, very much. And I love to stay in touch. And Hector, yes. I see you in the community. Thank you so much. Uh, I enjoy being part of the team here with uh, my friends at the So. And if anybody wants to learn Katia and they happen to be in South Florida, you're more than welcome to take my classes at Miami Dade College, which I've been teaching Katia there for nearly more than 10 years at this point. So, so that's an option as well. Yes. So great. That's that's a good ending point. Everyone who's interested and in Florida, please contact Hector. And I just say goodbye. And thanks for watching us. We are coming okay, back in September. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.